So welcome to this uh, series of the academic training on uh, particle physics foundation of dark matter, dark energy, and inflation. And we are particularly happy to have once again with us Rocky Kolb, who will give these lectures. I think uh, Rocky needs barely any introduction to his universal uh, knowledge. But um, let me just say that he has been director of the Particle Astrophysics Center at Fermilab for six years and is now the chair, if I understood your webpage well, of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Chicago. And of course, by all, a true expert on the matter of today. So without much ado, uh, Rocky, please. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to be here to present academic lectures for the third time. And I see some people here who are back for the third time. So the program would be three lectures. And in principle, I would spend one lecture on dark matter, one lecture on dark energy, and one lecture on inflation. But I suspect I will spend much more time on dark matter because I have more to say about dark matter and less time on dark energy, because there's not much to say about it, and uh, even less time on inflation. Although there's much to say about inflation, it's perhaps at the moment less relevant for the experimental program at CERN. So dark matter, dark energy, and inflation are the pillars of the standard model of cosmology. And one of the interesting things about these important features of the standard model of cosmology is that they all depend upon physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. So supporting dark matter, dark energy, and inflation is unknown physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. In fact, the only real observational, observational evidence for physics beyond the standard model comes from cosmology, comes from, in fact, a uh, field known as precision cosmology. So 20 years ago, it was impossible to use the words precision and cosmology in the same sent in a grammatically correct sentence with an even number of negatives. But in the past 20 years, there's been remarkable progress on, ex on observational cosmology, and these, this precision has pointed to physics beyond the standard model. So you might use the same quote that Einstein did in a letter to Arnold Sommerfeld, saying, how helpful is astronomy's pedantic accuracy, which I used to secretly ridicule. One of the jobs of a cosmologist is to try to understand the present composition of the universe. And the present composition of the universe, as contained in the Lambda CDM model, is a very small fraction of the total energy and mass and energy of the universe today in the form of radiation. Although the early universe was radiation dominated, today radiation is a very small fraction of the total mass and energy in the universe, and most of that radiation resides in the three degree microwave background radiation. This diagram also illustrates why chemistry is insignificant. I don't know why anyone studies chemistry. It is <laughs> only 0.025% of the mass and energy in the universe. It's very small compared to the mass today in the form of neutrinos. Stars that astronomers are fond of looking at is less than a percent of the total mass and energy in the universe. Most of the normal matter in the universe is in a hot gas of hydrogen and helium that's found in clusters of galaxies. But if you add up all the components of the total mass and energy in the universe today that we see and understand and measure and know something about, it's only 5% of what seems to be in the universe today. 95% of the mass and energy in the universe today is dark, 25% in the form of dark matter that we call cold dark matter and 70% in the form of dark energy. 
There was a famous quote by a king of Spain, Alphonse the Wise, in 1135, who looked at a series of epicycles and the standard cosmological model at the time, and he told his astronomers, if I had been present at creation, I would have suggested a simpler scheme. So perhaps the same thing can be said today. It seems to be a mismatch, a, a hodgepodge of various components in the mass and energy of the universe. So 95% of the universe is dark, and uh, we divide the dark sector into dark matter and dark energy because it seems to have very different properties. Dark matter seems to be responsible for holding structures together. It pulls things together. Seems to be a feature of the normal gravitational force, which is attractive. And I will, I will argue that the most likely possibility is that dark matter is a yet-to-be-discovered species of elementary particle. Dark energy, however, seems to be different. Dark energy seems to push things apart in the uh, expansion of the universe, seems to have some repulsive nature, and I will argue in the second lecture suggests that it's related to the weight of empty space, the weight of the vacuum. So dark matter and dark energy are names for phenomena, and they seem to be different phenomena. And the, one of the aspects of this that attracts me to the field is this connection between inner space and outer space, that to understand the largest things in the universe, Today I will talk about the structures of galaxies and other large-scale structure. You have to understand the smallest things in the universe. We have to understand what these structures are made of. So this is uh, the dark matter and dark energy and the present composition of the universe goes into the standard model of cosmology. As physical scientists, when we talk about models, we use it in a different way than our colleagues who are not in the physical sciences. For instance, if you talk to an economist, I wouldn't advise it, but if you do talk to an economist about models, an economist might say the construction of a model consists of snatching from the enormous and complex mass of facts called reality a few simple, easily managed key points, which becomes, for certain purposes, a substitute for reality itself. Now, I don't think, as physical scientists, we regard the standard model of particle physics as a substitute for reality itself, but actually part of reality. Because uh, economists have different ideas of what a model is. They have an economic model that involves an invisible hand, even stranger than dark matter. An invisible hand takes money out of one pocket and moves it to another. The invisible hand that's moving money around the economy. I don't think they really think that there is an invisible hand that's reaching into your pocket, but we really think that there is dark matter and dark energy. To us, it's not a substitute for reality, but actually it is an aspect of reality. So we want a model to actually be related to reality, not just represent observations. For 1,300 years, there was a cosmological model that did a very good job at uh, explaining the observations, and this was the geocentric model of Ptolemy, where the Earth was at rest more or less at the center of the universe and planets moved around the Earth and moved in epicycles. That explained the motions. So there was a previous consensus, convergent, dominant, best fit, standard cosmological model that was abandoned. It's often thought that it was abandoned because it was too complicated and involved epicycles, and it was replaced, of course, by this simple, beautiful model of Copernicus. And this is the famous diagram from book one of De Revolutionibus. 
But for those of you who think that Copernicus's model was simple or even simpler than Ptolemy's model, I invite you to read book three of De Revolutionibus, where you find diagrams like this, and you know what these are. These are epicycles, and if you love Latin, it's epicyclum, epicyclus, epicycli. Copernicus had more epicycles in his model than Ptolemy ever imagined. So the question is, is dark matter and dark energy our modern version of epicycles, things that we introduce to save the appearances, or are they part of physical reality? So today's lecture will be about dark matter, and I suspect it will spill over until uh, the second lecture tomorrow. The first indication of dark matter was in the 1930s when Fritz Zwicky studied galaxy clusters. Let me say a couple of words about Fritz Zwicky. He was born in Bulgaria. His father was a member of the Swiss Foreign Service. Uh, he was a Swiss citizen and he went to ETH in Zurich and studied under uh, Hermann Weil and Paul Scherer. Paul Scherer, of course, played a big role in the founding of CERN. And he, uh, after graduating from ETH, he took a position at Caltech in California. And he became an astronomer, and he observed clusters of galaxies, and noticed that there seemed to be more mass in the cluster of galaxies, as determined by measuring the velocities of, clus of cluster members, than he could account for in the form of what he saw as stars. And this was the first indication of dark matter in the 1930s. No one took Zwick Zwicky very seriously at the time because basically he was a very disagreeable person and no one liked Zwicky. He uh, learned he would caused a lot of people a lot of trouble, but not as much trouble as the person who lived next door to him when he was a student in Zurich. This other person ended up causing a lot more trouble. Zwicky's next door neighbor at Zurich was a Russian named Vladimir Lenin. So he didn't cause as much trouble as his neighbor, but he did cause a lot of trouble in astronomy. So this was around for 30 or 40 years, this idea of dark matter, but it wasn't taken seriously until people started looking at individual galaxies to determine the mass of a galaxy by the velocities. And this is a very simple idea. We can determine, as you know, the mass of the sun by determining the radius, the distance between the Earth and the sun and measuring the rotational velocity. If you measure V and measure R, you can determine the mass of the sun. And you can do a similar thing, involves a little bit of modeling, a little bit more complicated, but essentially, if you can measure the distance of objects from the center of a galaxy, and measure their velocity either through their redshift or their blue shift, you can determine the mass interior to some spherical radius. And if you are outside of the galaxy, whatever that means, and you measure the velocity and the distance of some test particle, then you can determine the mass of a galaxy. This was a program that was pioneered by the American astronomer Vera Rubin, and people took this seriously because unlike Zwicky, everybody liked Vera Rubin. And she measured individual galaxies, and here's an example of the nearby galaxy M33, and what she did was to measure the rotational velocity as a function of distance from the galaxy, and notice that what is observed is larger than the velocity that one would expect if all of the mass were, was contained in galaxies. Once you are outside of the galaxy, or outside most of the mass, you expect the rotational velocity to decrease as Kepler's laws, and that was not what Vera Rubin measured. So there seemed to be more mass in the galaxy than we could account for in the form of stars or any other thing that we could see. 
It's not just our galaxy, it's not just M33, but there's a program of measuring rotation curves now of hundreds of spiral galaxies, and it's measured out to very large distance. To put this on a scale, the distance between the sun and the center of our galaxy is about 8.5 kiloparsec. So here it's measuring very far out from the center of the galaxy, and the rotation curve does not drop. Most of the rotation curves become quite flat, which says that you haven't run out of mass, that presumably the mass is decreasing as 1 over r squared. So this is one indication looking at the dynamics of clusters and the rotation curves of galaxies, that there's more mass in the universe than we can account for in terms of what we see. Dark matter is also apparent by the phenomenon of, gra of weak gravitational lensing. If there is a massive object, a gravitational lens, then light from a star or a galaxy or some object will be deflected as it uh, passes the gravitational lens and there's some impact parameter B. So an observer, this is what a typical observer looks like, would observe the star or the object displaced from uh, its actual position. And the angle of deflection is related to the mass and distances. So if you observe the deflection angle, you can deduce the mass of the, uh, of the gravitational lens. This is uh, most strikingly seen by looking at objects known as Einstein rings. If you look at a source that's close to the optical axis that passes close to a gravitational lens, what the observer would see is not a point-like source, but the light from the source spread out in a ring known as the Einstein ring, and the mass of the lens determines the angular size of the Einstein ring. So measuring the angular size of the Einstein ring, you can deduce the mass of the lens, the total mass. So you want to look up into the, into the sky and see where there's gravitational lensing. Apparently, it's all over the sky. And if you look with a telescope with good optical resolution, like the Hubble Space Telescope, at a cluster of galaxies, this is the cluster Abel 2218, the light from objects behind the cluster form a gravity, uh, Einstein ring around the massive object, the galaxy cluster, causing the bending of light, and you can determine the mass of the cluster. This is an additional way to determine the mass of the cluster from the looking at the velocity dispersion of individual members of the cluster. And again, when this is done, you discover that there's much more mass associated with the cluster of galaxies than we can account for in the form of the stars or any of the gas that we do see. Another indication that there's more mass in the universe than we can see comes from measurements and determination of the cosmic abundance of the elements. Now, let me remind you why no one likes chemistry. There are too damn many elements. When I talk to high school students, they say, well, why couldn't, can't we study Greek chemistry? There were only four elements, earth, wind, and fire, no, earth, water, fire, and air. They say, why do we have to study so many elements? I tell them about the periodic table of a cosmologist. We have three elements in cosmology. <laughs> hydrogen, helium, and metals. Anything that's not hydrogen or helium, we just call a metal. Chemistry is much simplified. Now, we do this for two reasons. One, it really annoys chemists. And the other reason is that the universe today is 99% hydrogen and helium. So we can get chemistry 99% right 
just by assuming there's hydrogen and helium and metals. And of the dominant components of the universe today, hydrogen and helium, there seems to be a universal abundance of the isotopes of hydrogen and helium, about 10 parts in a million of hydrogen is in the form of deuterium, and about the same fraction of helium-3 is, uh, excuse me, of helium is in the form of helium-3 rather than helium-4. We understand this present abundance of the elements because the calculation of what the result of Big Bang nucleosynthesis is that three minutes AB, three minutes after the bang, the universe consisted of 76% hydrogen, 24% helium, and the universe, in order to make it through the first day, needed a little bit of lithium about 10 to the minus 8%, one part in 10 to the 10. It's about the same abundance of benzene that you will find in this water, but one part in 10 to the 10. I don't know what happened. Um, and the uh, exact abundance, in particular the isotopic abundance of hydrogen produced in the Big Bang, depends upon the present density of baryons. So this is a graph showing the result of Big Bang nucleosynthesis for the mass fraction of helium-4 and the number density of deuterium and helium-3 relative to hydrogen and also lithium-7. Indicated here are the, uh, what's believed to be the primordial abundance of these elements, and you get the correct primordial abundance, the observed primordial abundance, for a factor of omega b8 squared of about 2%. Here, omega is the fraction of the present density of that species in terms of the critical density, which is formed by a combination of Hubble's constant and Newton's constant. And little h is the reduced value of the uh, expansion rate today, Hubble's constant, in units of 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So just in terms of trying to remember things, h squared is approximately one half. Now, this is the primordial abundance that's predicted. There were no primordial observers, or at least any primordial observers did not publish their results. So we have to look at objects that are far away, objects that emitted light when they were very young, to try to get as close as possible to the primordial abundance. One way of doing this is looking at distant quasars. We can see quasars very far away use the light from the quasar as a beacon and see how it's absorbed by clouds of hydrogen known as Lyman alpha clouds. And this is a spectrum of this quasar that's at a redshift of 3.572. This is the light from the quasar and you see a deep absorption features due to clouds of, lime, uh, of, clouds of essentially hydrogen uh, that's absorbing the light from the quasar. If you look at a high dispersion spectrum at a particular small region of this spectrum, you'll see a dip caused by the absorption of one particular Lyman alpha cloud. This is caused by the absorption of hydrogen, and this feature here is due to the absorption of deuterium. And by looking at the relative depths and doing just a little bit of modeling, you can estimate and calculate the deuterium to hydrogen ratio in the early universe in these clouds. And the deuterium to hydrogen ratio is a very good determination of the primordial baryon, of the present baryon asymmetry, the present value of omega b h squared and to find consistency with Big Bang nucleosynthesis, it's about 2%, which is also consistent with the determination of the baryon density today found by measurements of the background radiation 
that I will talk about in the third lecture. Another indication for dark matter comes from understanding the, the evolution of structure in the universe. Structure in the universe forms by gravitational instability. Gravity is the ultimate capitalistic free market force. The rich get richer at the expense of the poor. Regions, if you do not have an exactly homogeneous distribution of matter, regions of the universe that are slightly richer in the mass density accrete the surrounding mass and structure grows with time. In order to understand the formation of structure in the universe, we need the addition of dark matter. We can also determine how many baryons there are in the universe by measuring the X-ray temperature of galaxy clusters. Most of the baryons in, in clusters of galaxies are in this hot gas, and the gas is hot because of the gravitational potential in the cluster. So by measuring the temperature of the X-ray gas, we can determine the total gravitational potential, the contribution due to baryons, and to dark matter. This is an image of a coma cluster in X-rays with the visual image of the coma cluster superimposed, and the X-ray temperature measures the depth of the gravitational potential, so we can measure the total mass density of the cluster. But finally, there's evidence for dark matter by looking at the results of the collisions of clusters of galaxies. This is a composite image of a uh, astronomical object known as the bullet cluster. The bullet cluster is the remnant of two cluster, two galaxy clusters that collided about two billion years ago last Tuesday. So this cluster is one cluster here and another cluster there. A couple of billion years ago, those cluster, uh, those galaxy clusters passed through each other. The individual galaxies did not scatter around and interact. And uh, but the gas that was once part of the cluster did interact. This is where most of the baryonic material is. And this is a shock wave of the gas that was associated with this cluster. And this is the result of the gas in red of, uh, that was associated with that cluster. The dark matter, most of the mass of the galaxy, is determined through gravitational lensing to be here and there. So we can understand this with the following simulation. So here we start with a ball that consists of gas, normal baryons, that's red, and dark matter, and today dark matter will be colored blue. So we're starting with these two clusters, as dark matter and baryons, baryons in the form of gas, and then we can see what happens when they collide. The dark matter is dissipationless and passes through unscathed, but the baryonic matter interacts and is shocked and stays behind. So that's the result of what we expect, and if you compare this again to the uh, image, it looks like what's observed. So this is a pretty clean system that seems to to tell us that most of the mass of clusters of galaxies is dissipationless. Most of the mass is not baryons. So the indication and the evidence for dark matter is much more than just rotation curves of galaxies or cluster dynamics. It involves the entire picture of structure formation, CMB, gravitational lensing, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, X-ray gas, cluster collisions. The evidence that there's more mass to galaxies and structures and large-scale structure clusters than we can see in the form of baryons is quite uh, complete. 
So we don't see dark matter. We don't see it. We can't see dark matter. Now, occasionally, in my office on the south side of Chicago, someone comes into my office all excited because I'm chair of astronomy, telling me that they have seen dark matter, that they can see dark matter. I direct them to the medical center because they can't really see dark matter, but we can ask a computer to tell us what a galaxy would look like if we could see dark matter. In terms of phase space, we think this is what a galaxy, typical galaxy, would look like. The galaxy that's visible that we do see would be this yellow disk in the center. That's where the baryons and the stars are concentrated, but it's surrounded by dark matter that's dense in the center, then the density decreases as you go out. That's the halo dark matter. And presumably there's also clumps of dark matter, satellite clumps of dark matter that surrounds the galaxy. So there's much more to a galaxy than we can see. This is the result of a numerical simulation, and I'll show you other results from numerical simulation. Now, I see some of you are probably graduate students, and your advisor may have told you for your thesis you're to do a simulation. And you may have scratched your head and said, what in the hell is a simulation? So I suggest you look at the Oxford English Dictionary for the definition of simulation, it's the action or practice of simulating with intent to deceive. A false pretense in a deceitful profession. So now you know exactly what you're being asked to do by your advisor. All right, so there's, when we look out at the universe, we only see the tip of the iceberg in terms of mass, most of the mass is invisible to us. We don't know what it is. And from Big Bang nucleosynthesis and other reasoning, not only is most of the mass invisible, but it doesn't seem to be normal stuff. So when we look at a galaxy, there are missing pieces that we don't see. These missing pieces we call dark matter. What could be the dark matter? One idea is that, in fact, there is no dark matter. We only deduce there is dark matter because of something that's known as modified Newtonian dynamics. Some, we use Newton's laws to calculate the mass. Maybe Newtonian dynamics or the force of gravity is very different on astronomical scales or for very low accelerations. Now, we want, of course, to relate what we see in astronomy to something, some experiment that we do or some other evidence. So we can ask, is there any other evidence that's ever been discovered of modified Newtonian dynamics? And I just love to show this in Switzerland because the answer is yes. Velocity is equal to mass times acceleration that is a modification of Newtonian dynamics, a big modification. And of course, we have to take this seriously because it is a Swiss chronometer. It's not even a watch. I've learned the difference is about 2,000 Swiss francs. <laughs> this is the only other evidence of, mod of a modified Newtonian dynamics. So let's uh, assume that it's not modified Newtonian dynamics. What could the dark matter be? Sorry? Yeah. So, so when one opens then uh, a book written by someone who doesn't agree on that, so the, typical, the typical point that they make is the tally fisher relation not being predicted in... Uh, in the context of dark matter. So I'm not saying that this proves that, uh, that, 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 that one has to modify news and dynamic, but still, it's true that we have a model that cannot predict uh, the low acceleration regime so well. The dynamic of the galaxy and the low acceleration regime uh, is not so well predicted. 
is this the first statement and we don't we okay. are not I mean we can sleep regardless of this okay so um, I agree the dark matter is a name for a phenomenon and I, as a scientist, am trying to chase down what I think is the best explanation for this phenomenon. So this was, I did this for a joke. It's sort of, I, I think it's sort of funny. And I think the best explanation for dark matter is not a modification of Newtonian dynamics or a modification of general relativity. Dark matter is seen on many scales and in fact, it's not just the dynamics and acceleration. You also have to have a model that accounts for gravitational lensing, the, the growth of structure. All of the pieces, all of the evidence for dark matter fit together in sort of a nice picture if we can just figure out what the damn dark matter is. So that's, that's, uh, that's the approach I'm going to take. One possibility that people have proposed is that the dark matter in galaxies is not anything new, but it's in objects that we can't see, astronomical objects that we can't see. For instance, rogue planets. People have proposed that the, most of the mass of the Milky Way and other galaxies is in the form of planets. And there are different types of planets. There are gas planets, the big gas planets. And we could maybe see those in the infrared, but there's my favorite type of planet, personal favorite, is other rocky planets. And perhaps the galaxy is just full of little rocky planets. Another possibility that people have proposed is that maybe it's not planets, but it's in things that are described as mass challenge stars. In the pre-politically correct era, they were called dwarf stars, but we don't refer to them as dwarf stars anymore. They are mass challenge stars. Mass challenge stars are also light challenge stars. Perhaps there's just a lot of little runty stars in the galaxy that are not producing much light. Another obvious possibility is that most of the mass of the galaxy is in the form of black holes. Black holes do not emit light, not light that we can see. Hawking radiation for large objects like solar mass black holes is very small. Taken as a whole, these are described as massive astronomical compact halo objects or machos. So perhaps our galaxy is not the mass of the galaxy is not in the form of anything exotic in the, any new species, but in the form of normal matter that's just packed together in ways that we can't see. There was an experiment, several experiments, that tested this idea by looking at the effect of these small objects on gra uh, gravitational microlensing. And the result of gravitational microlensing excluded more than 20% of the mass of our halo in the form of machos between a mass of about 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 7 solar masses and about 10 to the minus 1 solar masses. And if stars have a mass larger than about a tenth of a solar mass, they would be visible. So again, the final word is, you know, it's, this is the result that I wouldn't bet my life on to exclude machos, I'd bet a collaborator's life, but I wouldn't bet my life, but I think it's a, a fair bet that it's excluded. So the idea that's left behind that I'd like to pursue is that the dark matter is some particle relic from the Big Bang. So what sort of particle relics can there be from the Big Bang? One, the possibility that I will pursue again is the idea that the, that the particle relic is a weakly interacting massive particle or a WIMP. So one thing we've learned is that WIMPs dominate machos, something that was not predicted. Okay, what about particle dark matter? What kind of particle dark matter species might we have? There. 
there is a long list of proposed particles for dark matter, and I'll talk about a few of them, but let me point out the great service done by theorists. After 35 years of work, theorists have narrowed the possible mass range of dark matter to a mere 81 orders of magnitude in mass between Bose-Einstein condensates and axion clusters. And we've narrowed the possible interactions of dark matter between gravitational and strongly interacting. So this is, thank you very much, this is 35 years of effort on the theoretical community. So let me first talk about the idea that neutrinos could be the missing mass, the dark matter, and we used to talk about something being massive enough to close the universe. This is a paper talking about neutrino masses written by some friends of mine, and you might say, well, who really cares if, what neutrinos do if they have mass? No one cares if they close the universe. But if you read this paper, you will discover down here the possibility that relictile neutrinos have sufficient energy density to close the university. <laughs> that is something we all care about, that neutrinos might close the university. Okay, what about wimpy neutrinos? Neutrinos have a mass, they're weakly interacting, they were produced in the Big Bang. Could the neutrinos be the wimps? Well, this has an advantage, this idea has an advantage that neutrinos exist. We know neutrinos exist. There's evidence that neutrinos exist. There it is. We know that there are three active neutrinos and other neutrinos must be sterile. One of these neutrinos <laughs> must be sterile. Neutrinos have mass, they oscillate, presumably they have mass, and again, we only know mass differences, but the mass scales for atmospheric neutrinos and solar neutrinos are much less than an electron vote. Neutrinos contribute to dark matter as a hot thermal relic. They should have a very large velocity, they should be hot, and the contribution to the mass density is the mass over 47 electron volts. So this is too small for this type of mass neutrino. So the conclusion is neutrinos are WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. They do contribute to the mass density, but not enough. So perhaps there is another type of WIMP. Neutrinos are too hot and too light, but we can go on and make and imagine particles produced in the Big Bang that are not as massive, uh, that are more massive than neutrinos and have a smaller velocity, they're warm, and examples of this are stereo neutrinos and gravitinos. Now, stereo neutrinos and gravitinos are sort of a chimera with aspects of different creatures. They have weaker interactions than neutrinos. They decouple earlier in the history of the universe. They are diluted more in the expansion of the universe, so they can have a larger mass and a smaller velocity than neutrinos. This is a possibility for dark matter, but I think that uh, particle models with stero neutrinos or gravitinos as dark matter um, in the desired mass range are, in my opinion, unfashionable. Doesn't mean they're wrong, but I don't think that's the way to go. A much more likely possibility is that the dark matter is cold. It has very small velocities today, which in, the, in most cases mean they are more massive. And the possibility for that fall under the heading of a cold thermal relic, something that is a relic in the sense of being left over from the Big Bang, but also a relic in terms of the definition of a relic, which is, which is an object of particular veneration. 
and cosmologists venerate relics. So the idea of a cold thermal relic is quite simple if we assume that the particle remains in equilibrium, then as the temperature drops to be smaller than the mass, if the mass is larger than the temperature, the equilibrium abundance decreases exponentially with the Boltzmann factor for the temperatures smaller than the mass. So if a particle would always remain in equilibrium, it would be insignificant today if the temperature is, if the mass is much larger than the present temperature. However, a particle doesn't always remain in equilibrium. It remains in equilibrium for a while and then it freezes out. And where it freezes out determines the present contribution to the total mass density in that species. And where it freezes out depends upon its interaction strength. If it has a lower interaction strength, it remains in equilibrium longer. I'm sorry, if it has a larger interaction strength, it remains in equilibrium longer, freezes out at a lower temperature, and would have a smaller contribution to omega. If it interacts even more strongly, it remains in equilibrium even longer, falling down this exponential tail, and has a smaller contribution to omega. So as you increase the annihilation cross-section, you decrease the contribution to omega. You decrease the present importance of this particle. So the more weakly interacting the particle is, the larger its present contribution to the energy density. So you can go through and calculate what the interaction cross-section should be in order to get the dark matter density to explain the astronomical phenomenon. And this is not a new idea. 35 years ago this month was the, I believe, the first uh, suggestion of a cold thermal relic to be the dark matter. It was a paper written by Ben Lee and Steve Weinberg in 1977, and the calculations that they did in this paper were the calculations we continue to do. They solved the Boltzmann equation for the number density of the cold thermal relic as a function of temperature, and what they discovered is if the annihilation cross-section increases, then the present abundance in that particle decreases. So this is a graph that's familiar to all cosmologists, and this was 35 years ago. Now, you can calculate what cross-section is necessary if cold thermal relics are WIMPs, and you find that the cross-section, and presumably the mass of the new species, is of order the weak scale, that's why it's called a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle, and this has been named and called the WIMP miracle. I don't know who first called it the WIMP miracle, but I'd like to slap that person because a miracle is an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. As scientists, we are not allowed to invoke miracle. It's a terrible name to use in science hate the idea of a miracle having to do with the wimp. So the real question is the fact that you expect a weak mass and a weak cross-section, is that a coincidence or is it causation? It has nothing to do with a miracle. So let's now chase down this idea that the dark matter is a weakly interacting massive particle then there's a goal in particle physics and a goal in astrophysics. In particle physics, the goal is to discover in the laboratory the dark matter and learn how it is grounded in physical law and embedded in some overarching physics model or theory. We cannot be satisfied just to say that there is some dark matter particle that we see some evidence of 
that has a certain mass and cross-section, we want to know how that fits into the larger schema of physics. And in astrophysics, we want to understand the role of dark matter in the formation of structure and the evolution of structure. So what do we know about WIMPs? We know it is massive, stable, weakly interacting, that presumably it is an SU3 cross U1 singlet, and it must be a BSM particle, but maybe not far beyond the standard model. WIMPs are almost too good to be true in the following sense. The annihilation cross-section determines the present abundance. Let's imagine that there's a particle, a WIMP and an anti-WIMP that annihilates to quarks and anti-quarks. So in the early universe, the, pres the abundance of the WIMPs were determined by the annihilation cross-section into quarks. So since we know the value of omega today, we know something about the annihilation cross-section of the WIMP. If we know something about the annihilation cross-section, we know something about this, the strength of this interaction, we can cross this diagram and we know something about the scattering cross-section of the WIMP with quarks, presumably with nucleons. And we can reverse all the arrows since we know the matrix element associated with this, know something about it. We can deduce something about the production cross-section to make WIMP pairs in QQ bar collisions. Now, I've given this broad picture, but a, you know, there are a lot of complications and if, ands, or buts that employs cosmologists. This picture is not quite so simple. There's velocity dependence, the possibility of co-annihilation, annihilation through resonances, super wimps where you make one wimp that decays to another wimp, and there's, there's, there's subleading dependencies on the mass, number of degrees of freedom, temperature. There's, uh, it's not quite so simple, but the general feature is correct. And in this relationship, it's not quite so simple. There's velocity dependence in the cross sections. It depends upon the detection rate in experiments will, for direct detection, depends upon the local phase space density of the WIMP. There could be flavor dependence in, uh, the, in the interaction of the WIMP with quarks. The quark, uh, the WIMP could be leptophilic, leptophobic, could interact in, with different flavors in different ways. You can, uh, co-production would give you a different cross-section. There are things known as Sommerfeld enhancements that you have to worry about for annihilation. So there are complications, but the basic feature is correct. So what is everyone's favorite model for a WIMP? I don't know about everyone's favorite model, but I ask someone in the theory group here, what's your favorite model for a WIMP? And John Ellis told me, of course, it is a supersymmetric relic. And it was 28 years ago that the paper was written by two people at Slack and some people at CERN pointing out that supersymmetric relics um, could be the dark matter. Some of you may know John Ellis and John Haglin. John, uh, one of them went on to go, to go sort of off mass shell doing crazy things, and the other person is John Haglin. <laughs> okay, the idea of a Suzy wimp is, and this actually is, I think globally also, the favorite thermal relic, is that the neutralino is some combination of Binos, Winos, Higgsinos, and of course in supersymmetry there's the unfortunate proliferation of parameters, 105 or so new parameters, so that determines the mass of the lightest supersymmetric particle and its interactions too many parameters to play with, so you somehow constrain it, make it minimal, and end up with some smaller number of parameters. And then uh, you calculate what the present abundance would be, and you find regions of parameter space where the lightest supersymmetric particle is a neutralino and would be the dark matter. 
Now, typical SUSY models, the scale of supersymmetry breaking has been pushed to sufficiently large scale from collider and other high precision measurements that typical SUSY models have, would have too large a value of omega. The mass scale is too large, they interact so weakly that the neutralino would be too abundant. So you need some kind of chicanery to increase the annihilation cross-section, and there are several ways to do this, more or less reasonable, S-channel resonance through light H and Z poles, co-annihilation with, that's a stop or a style, large tan beta, which would give S-channel annihilation through a broad A resonance, high values of, the, of M0, the LSP would be hexeno-like and annihilate in, into W and Z pairs. This is known as a focus point region. Or it could be that the supersymmetric model, if it's there at low energy, is unconstrained. So the way to look for SUSY WIMPs is to look for the partners, the supersymmetric partners. And in the bulk region, there are light superpartners and the LHC today is chewing away at the allowed region of supersymmetric parameter space, but it's too early to throw in the Taolino. Another possibility, another local favorite for dark matter is that it could be a kaluza klein wimp an excitation of a photon in an extra dimension. And um, if you have extra dimensions, there are quantized kaluza klein excitations the momentum in the extra dimension appears in the dimensionally reduced world as a mass for a particle. And if you, the first excited mode is stable, and if you ha, can orbifold the circle and make it something that will give you chirofermions, there's a parity remains, and the first excited mode is stable. So perhaps the dark matter is in excited mode of particles we know in extra dimensions. And again, the best way to find, in this case, it would be the ex excitation of the photon. The first excited mode of the photon would be the dark matter. And these, um, you look for these other particles, and again, the LHC is chewing away at the allowed region. Another way, uh, so those are possibilities for dark matter. And you can look also for dark matter through direct detection of the dark matter. Look for the scattering of the relic dark matter with um, nucleons in direct detection experiments today. And I see it's noon. This is, it's a three hour lecture today or three hours total? I guess it's three hours total, so I should stop now and ask for questions, and then I'll continue the dark matter discussion tomorrow. Thank you. And yes. Uh, can we say anything about the nature of dark matter interaction? So through the form they form in the galaxies. I mean, they seem to be spherically symmetric, while the visible matter seems to have uh, sort of the spiral structure. So what sort of interaction would be responsible for the difference in the distribution? Okay, the, the question is, dark matter seems to be in a diffuse, roughly spherical halo, presumably not exactly spherical, Whereas the matter that we do see, at least in spiral galaxies, are in a disk and smaller. And the explanation for that is due to the fact that in this standard picture, the dark matter is dissipationless. So if you start with a density perturbation, a clump that contains both dark matter and baryons mixed up, and then watch it as it collapses gravitationally, the dark matter being dissipationless will collapse and pass through each other and then uh, form some system, but it doesn't lose energy, it doesn't radiate energy because it's dissipationless to fall deep into the potential well. 
Baryons, on the other hand, can scatter and shock and radiate and lose energy to fall deeper into the gravitational potential well. So there is good understanding of why the baryons, the stars that we see in spiral galaxies, are disk-like, but while the dark matter is more diffuse and roughly spherical. Yes? You mentioned in the beginning that uh, all our BSM uh, evidence comes from cosmology. Could you explain why I don't consider neutrino oscillations as the evidence for BSM physics? Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. So neutrino oscillations is evidence for beyond the standard model. Uh, now I think the standard model is enlarged to include the possibility of neutrino oscillations. So neutrino oscillations is also evidence for, for physics beyond the standard model. I would also put into that category the strong CP problem, which is evidence perhaps for axions, which would be beyond the standard model of particle physics. So I should amend what I said. But then why don't you consider sterile neutrinos as a natural dark matter candidate? Sterile neutrinos are considered as a natural dark matter candidate. And some, there are some people who are proponents of sterile neutrinos to be the dark matter. If, it would depend upon the mass and the properties of the sterile neutrinos. Yes. So for what concerns the, the radiational velocity versus the radius, the plus by Vera Rubin. And, uh, so from that, one can basically, knowing the kind of model that, uh, that we expect for the baryonic matter and knowing having a model for the, the scale, one can actually get the fraction of uh, dark matter to total matter. So the phenomenology of this fraction with respect to the kind of stars that we see, is there any correlation like uh, the, the fraction being a constant, the fraction changing depending on... Uh, so the dark the, matter to normal matter ratio? Yes. Is there an indication... There, is, there are indications that it's a scale-dependent uh, ratio. So if you look on small scales, if we look in this room, <laughs> we're dominated by normal matter. And if you look on larger scales, the uh, effect of dark matter becomes more dominant, eventually reaching roughly a factor of six times more dark matter on the largest scales than uh, normal matter. So the overall universal value of dark matter density seems to be about six or so times normal matter. And it is scale dependent. We expect it to be scale dependent. There are uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxies that seem to be dark matter dominated much more than our galaxy. And you would have to understand the formation of these structures taking into account the dark matter, which is easy to model because it's dissipationless, but then you also have to try to figure out what happens to the baryons undergoing scattering, hydrodynamics, and that's something that's more difficult to do. There was another question. Yeah, you mentioned the Lee Weinberg paper. One of the things that they suggested in the paper was a lower bound for the WIMP mass, if it's a particle of a few GeV. They had, in fact, well, the bound depends upon the cross-section and the type of model. This was a Dirac neutrino. Yeah. And they got 2 GeV, other people do the calculation, and got 10 GeV, 5 GeV, but a few GeV. So if there were a Dirac neutrino interacting with the Z, yeah. so let's ignore our lap. There was some, some accelerator here before LHC, I'm told, that ruled this out, and it was also ruled out by direct detection. But it was the first attempt. But this was in the dark ages when we didn't know this idea was ruled out. So what's the minimum now? What, what's your best guess for? For the mass of the WIMP? Is there a minimum mass of the WIMP? In fact, there is some evidence, and I'll talk about this on uh, tomorrow, on Thursday, 
there's some evidence that people claim that the dark matter is as low as 6 GeV from direct detection experiments. It's not a direct neutrino at 6 GeV interacting with the Z. We know that's ruled out, but it's some other type of model, and I'll talk about that evidence tomorrow. Okay, thank you. See you tomorrow.